Save 10% with my code BOBBY10 on raw, organic, grass-fed and grass-finished freeze-dried organ meats from Grassland Nutrition. Link in the description box. Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, finally, we're gonna react to The Genius of Islam, episode 1, The Modern Human Condition, by the Muslim skeptic Daniel Hakikachu. So this video has been heavily requested by you guys. Usually I never watch videos before I react to them. You always get a genuine reaction. However, this time I have to say that I used this video for some stock footage here and there whilst editing my own videos. So I've seen one or the other part. Nevertheless, I never saw it in totality and therefore I'm looking forward to see the whole thing today. With no further ado, let's have a look. Ladies and gentlemen, we may be approaching a fateful hour. D-Day is here. The invasion has begun. The production value on this one, man. First, some context. Science fiction portrays three visions of the future of humanity. First, there's the dystopian future where all of mankind is enslaved as the human spirit is crushed under the weight of a totalitarian regime that reduces human beings to mere cogs in a massive technocratic wasteland. Second, there's the equally dystopian future where humanity is also enslaved, but authorities use mass media in tandem with powerful pharmaceuticals to dope the masses into seeing their condition as one of freedom, pleasure, and bliss. Then there's a third vision of the future, perhaps the most terrifying, where the human race no longer exists because technology has finally made the human body and even the human mind obsolete. Transhumanism. Instead of men and women, the world is populated with robots, androids, and disembodied cyberhumans. Our current reality in the modern world is the realization of not one or two of these dystopian futures, but all three. We're Probably. told that current year might not be perfect, but it's far better than any other time in human history. Yeah. This is because humanity is Progress. constantly progressing. Constant <laughs> economic growth, constant technological advancement, constant yeah. moral progress as mm. humanity discovers UN. new human rights and new freedoms to be championed in the latest social justice campaigns. Humans are better off now than they were at any time in history, or so we're told. I never was an atheist, thank God, but there was a time where I looked into Buddhism, Hinduism, shamanism, and I traveled the world to explore those different belief systems, and moreover, I became a vegan. I really bought into the vegan doctrine and I thought that we are evil as human beings because we kill animals. We slaughter them, we eat them, we populate the planet. We are this bad, bad human being and somehow we have to get rid of our biology. And this is when I bought into the doctrine of transhumanism. I really believed in transhumanism as a salvation for mankind. But if you really look into it, you see how it is from the devil because it promises you salvation within this world. It I promise you salvation here, that you will never have to die, eternal life. But we of course have to understand as believers that eternal life comes after this life, which is a test. But this is exactly how the devil flips the whole thing and tells you, hey, listen, there is no life after this. You simply die, the lights go off, so you might as well enjoy this to the max, and the maximum enjoyment would be if you get rid of your body. You consistently get sick, you get fat, you don't have the dream body that you wanted you don't have the women maybe that you wanted so why don't you plug yourself into the vr and enjoy all the women and more on a daily basis non-stop cooming humans are better off now than they were at any time in history or so we're told but what is the reality think about the modern person's life from the moment he's born to the moment he dies modern man finds himself institutionalized, 
Yeah. He's born in an institution run by the state, the hospital. The instant he comes into the world, he's grabbed by the medical professionals and weighed and measured and injected. After a day or two, he yeah, might- Yeah, thank God my kid wasn't injected. I didn't let anything near him. I get to leave that institution, but guess what? His mother is a strong, independent woman who has to work <laughs> at a soulless job to make ends meet. Yes. Statistically, it's most likely that she's a single mother and doesn't have a husband or committed family to help with a new baby. Ah, to be honest, even if she would have that, you look into European countries and the taxation, etc., etc., a man cannot even provide any longer. So therefore, they both need to provide in order to have a functioning family, which of course ultimately is the opposite of a functioning family. So the baby has to go to daycare, another yes. institution, for most of the day, surrounded by more professionals. At age four, he's transferred to yet another institution, grade school, where more professionals make sure he's properly educated. Eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, he's fed the state-mandated curriculum, ensuring that he becomes an obedient citizen, an obedient consumer. He a good global citizen. He gets older and goes to college, another institution, meant to train him to be a productive citizen who thinks the right thoughts, <laughs> believes the right beliefs. Yes. After graduation, he can look... But how can you say that, Daniel? We have freedom of speech, don't we? Sarcasm, guys. Of course, we do not. If you look into Germany, for example, you cannot say anything about a certain political time frame within Germany. You cannot even have a different opinion upon the matter. Otherwise, Otherwise you end up in prison. Or to desperately searching for a job to pay back tens of thousands of dollars in student debt. If you can't find a job in his field, ah, you can always find yes. menial labor for minimum wage. Mm -hmm. If he's lucky, he might hit the jackpot working as a wage slave plugged into the corporate rat race. Every day he drags himself out of bed sits behind the computer for 40 hours a week, comes know, home exhausted, too tired and emotionally burnt out to do anything other than order takeout and watch Netflix. Maybe he gets married, maybe he has one or two kids, but really, what's the point? They're all locked into their own institutional existence for most waking hours of their atomized lives. It's a great video, man. So he works like this. He works like this for 40 years only to retire most likely he's divorced by then his kids have long ago to retire yes absolutely my dad retired with 64 years of age my mother she's a nurse and they tell her now that she will be able to retire when she's 69 she's a nurse working at a hospital when she's 69 she's gonna be so broken god forbid that she ends up in the same hospital what's the point on he has to spend the end of his life alone maybe in a nursing home the final institution so from birth until death, virtually every moment of his life was mediated by a state or corporate institution. Or maybe he will end up living alone and when he dies in his apartment, no one will really know. He has no family to visit him or care for him and when he dies, it'll only become apparent a few months later when the growing stench of his rotting corpse wafts into the halls of his apartment building. And That's then again, dramatic, the but he's right has to be called to dispose of the putrid nails. It's very dark, man. This sad existence is not unusual. It's in fact the norm. It's the model, it's by design, the logical consequence of a materialist progressive worldview. After all, Real happiness, according to materialists, is not to be found in some promised heaven in an imagined afterlife. This life is all we have, and material exactly. bodies are all that exist. As such, the meaning of life is really about maximizing bodily delights and reducing pain and toil. And the yes. best way, indeed the only way, to maximize pleasure and minimize toil, according to this philosophy, is through goods and services. Give people more food, 
more entertainment, more gadgets, produce more technology and more automation, which will make life more convenient, more, more, more. Yes, absolutely. This is the premise of this godless society. There is no universal moral. There is no universal standard of what is right and wrong, but somehow pleasure good and pain evil. This is the same ideology that you find within veganism, which ultimately leads to all that fake meat and eating the bugs. Because 99% of vegans are atheists. They do not believe in any god. They do not believe in any real right and wrong, but in their worldview, pain is bad and pleasure is good. Therefore, sit on your couch, drink the soy latte and save the animals. The more goods and services people have, the happier they'll be, the freer they'll be. Yeah. One year you have basic cars, the next year cars become more advanced with power steering and the next year they're even more advanced with airbags and Bluetooth and GPS mm -hmm. and so on until you have self-driving cars and on and on. Products become better and more plentiful. This is progress. Yep. Progress for the, the sake classic. of progress, this is. How can we progress in the institutions of our children? Hey, let's introduce Drag Queen Story Hour. It is progress after all. The West doesn't care in which direction it progresses. Of course, this is not a real progression into the positive. It is a degeneration, but we're going further. Critical liberal thinkers and the early economists, people like John Locke, John Stuart Mill, Jeremy Bentham mm. and Adam Smith, they're all progressivists. They all agreed that human happiness was tied to more goods and services and more goods and services would eventually bring human freedom, equality and ultimately utopia. Mm -hmm. Communist thinkers were no different. In fact, communism as a materialist philosophy sure. fully agrees that human happiness and freedom can only come from more and more goods and services. Of course, because within communism, the state is your god. I was born into communism in communist Yugoslavia. Back then, I got baptized in our flat because churches and mosques were shut down. The communist only disagrees with his liberal counterpart on how best to achieve and distribute those goods and services, but the underlying materialism is the same. Yes. Does non-stop consumption lead to freedom and happiness? Sure, some aspects of happiness can be put in consumer terms like food, shelter, the basic needs of life, but most human happiness doesn't depend on products. The happiness that comes from a loving and committed relationship with the opposite sex, the happiness that comes from growing old with a loving family and devoted children, the happiness that comes from sharing an identity with other human beings centered around pursuit of a higher purpose, these profound sources of happiness are not in terms of bodily pleasures, they're not consumerist in nature, and in fact the consumer economy does a great deal to dissolve these organic relationships and replace them with alternatives. Mm. Why bother with the duties of marriage when you can use a convenient sex app or online pornography to perpetually satisfy carnal lusts? Why bother with the burden of having to raise your children yourself when daycare services make it so easy to ship them off while so you pursue sad. your personal career ambitions? Why bother with the burden of serving God and uniting with the community of the faithful when you can wallow in the faux feel-good mixed spirituality <laughs> offered by flashy motivational speakers mm. whose cloying adjurations are broadcast directly via social media to the palm of your hand? <laughs> It's the intrusiveness of consumer technology that has created a modern society that is more atomized, more individualistic, and sure. ultimately more depressed, more lonely, more unhappy, more disconnected from everything that makes life worth living. Yeah, but they won't see this somehow. I talk to atheists, I talk to vegans, as I said, and most of them, they are on antidepressants. But they will tell you this is a normal condition. It just so happens that they are on antidepressants. So what? Many people are on antidepressants. Totally normal. Nothing to see here. And they won't be able to reflect that their lifestyle choices led them there. They think it's a normal part of life. And nowadays, unfortunately, it really became a normal part of life because people are medicated in order to cope with this disgusting lifestyle. The human mind naturally shuns such an artificial existence. 
The only way yeah. modern people survive is by constant use of drugs, alcohol, painkillers, and antidepressants to numb the senses. And Many. still, suicide rates and drug overdose deaths have been climbing year after year. Modern unhappiness is truly unique. Perhaps most telling is what's called the happiness income paradox. Contrary to the materialists, happiness doesn't increase when income increases. When the happiness levels and income levels in dozens of countries around the world are tracked over a long period of time, it becomes evident that more material wealth does not equal more happiness. But other studies... Yeah, okay, it depends how you track that, of course. If you look into the Western countries and income has been rising, but at the same time expenses have been rising as well, and therefore surely those people become more and more depressed. On top of that, all kinds of restriction within those countries and a further removal from the family, etc., etc., you name it. But if we're talking about the individual that had a raise in income, of course, that will add something to the happiness. Please paint a darker picture once basic needs are met, a person's happiness is strongly correlated with perceived social rank and relative status. Sure. In other words, how rich are you compared to other people? Research shows that relative wealth and comparative status play a dominant role in people's happiness levels. This is why a millionaire, despite all his wealth, can still be very unhappy if his social circle is filled with billionaires. And why a billionaire can feel very unhappy if his social circle is filled with mega billionaires. Of course. The paradox here is that a person can endlessly increase his wealth. But if those around him are increasing their wealth at a faster rate, then he'll eventually become less happy over time. This phenomenon <laughs> is true. referred to as the relative income hypothesis. Okay. What researchers have found is that it's a part of human nature that people who have higher status than those around them naturally feel more confident, have higher self-esteem, yep. and are more happy. This is even seen in the animal kingdom. Yes, absolutely, exactly. Because if you look into income, what does it really mean? Ultimately, we as men, we are providers. So back in the day, we would go out, hunt, and therefore we would bring back meat. That's basically it. So money equals meat, money equals food. Of course, nowadays you can buy all kinds of other things. You can buy cars, houses, and all kinds of luxurious items. But ultimately, it is about you as a man providing. If you are successful in providing as a male you will be happy and therefore the richer you get of course you will get more confident with that as well because it shows that you are a great provider by contrast those with lower social status have higher levels of depression Bad stress providers. paranoia and mental illness yes this has huge implications for how we understand the connection between happiness and the economy if sure. people's happiness is so closely tied to relative status, then a constantly growing modern economy is much more a source of despair than it is of happiness. Just consider the reality of the ever burgeoning okay. wealth gap, where 1% of the world's people own 50% of the world's wealth. The gap between the rich and the poor is absolutely unprecedented in modern times. And due to the relative income hypothesis, this also means that the levels of unhappiness and depression are also unprecedented. And the salt in the proverbial wound is that media technologies like TV and social media display the lives of the rich and famous in agonizing detail, sure. which only heightens the sense of relative privation in the minds of the 99% leading to dissatisfaction and depression on a global scale. Consider this paradox. People in yeah, I see the point and I do not disagree with it in particular because I know that there are many, many people that are easily influenced. However, I have a different worldview on it. So back in the day, for example, when I saw my first Flex magazine, Flex magazine was a bodybuilding magazine. And I saw that and I showed it to my teacher. My teacher told me that this is an absolutely unattainable body goal. This is unrealistic and I shouldn't even look at it. But ultimately, I thought to myself, this is ridiculous because somebody achieved it. So now now, if you're not willing to put in the work, then get over it. Don't get obsessed by it. Just leave it be. It's fine. But if you want to do it, 
you can do it. It is what it is. We are all given our certain genetic codes, of course, but nevertheless, if we put in the work, we will get a benefit, we will get a reward. And therefore, I knew that if I put in all my effort into bodybuilding, I will achieve a great physique. And so I did. Therefore, when I see rich people, if I see something attractive within that lifestyle, such as great cars, I am a car fan myself, I like race bikes, I do enjoy certain luxurious things. So I want to go after those things. I take it as a motivation. If I reach it, thank God. If I don't, then thank God as well. Then it wasn't for me. But nevertheless, it won't change that I would like to put in effort into those things. Such a display of wealth or such a display of muscularity will never make me personally depressed, especially as a believer, because I do believe that God gifts certain people. Some people get the riches, some people get the fame, some people get something else. Some people get beautiful families, 10 children, 15 children and whatnot. Others don't get any. Ultimately, it comes down to God's plan anyways. So therefore, I cannot complain about it or feel depressed about it. Developing countries that's have me. actually become wealthier in absolute terms over the past century. But despite the increased wealth, their overall happiness has decreased. How can that be? This is because they experience themselves as poor. Why? Because relative to Western economic growth over sure. the same century, they're poor in comparison. For example, colonialism and capitalism have without a doubt made the Muslim world and the developing world wealthier in material terms than it's ever been. But overall, people in the developing world in all these countries feel poorer and feel less happy. Why? Because in the past, their wealth was relatively equal to Europe or even higher. But even though they have more absolute wealth now than they did in the past, their relative position compared to the West has dropped. Due to colonialism and other factors, the West grew richer at a far greater pace, creating an insurmountable wealth gap. This global inequality generates a lot of unhappiness, paranoia, and depression for poor nations. And by the same token, it generates a lot of happiness and satisfaction for richer nations who feel good about being above others. But is the wealth gap between richer and poorer nations really insurmountable? Can't developing nations eventually catch up to the West and enjoy equal wealth and status? Doesn't a capitalist global economy provide a fair playing field for all? The answer is a resounding no. What theorists like Emmanuel Wallerstein and Thomas Piketty have pointed out is that the liberal capitalist model does not account for structural inequality. The reason that 1% of the population owns 50% of the world's wealth in an ever-growing wealth gap is not due to sheer hard work and perseverance. The reason that Western nations have had overwhelmingly more wealth and held overwhelmingly more control over the rest of the world for the past few centuries is not due to sheer ingenuity. Rather, there's a clear structural inequality hardwired into global capitalism that prevents other countries from being able to catch up with the West. Sure. Sociologist Emmanuel Wallerstein points to the fact that because the technological revolution began in the West, they were able to accumulate a great deal of capital. Using this capital, they were able it's to monopoly, invest man. more into research and development, R&D, more so than other nations, which led to more innovation, better products, more high-tech products. Other nations couldn't compete with this, and so they were locked into a low-tech economy relative to the West, where they're producing low-margin, low-tech goods and raw materials. Meanwhile, the Western nations create better, higher-tech goods and sell those at higher margins, which brings more profit, which they can invest in more R&D, more innovation, and the vicious cycle continues. To be honest, this doesn't really strike me. Of course, it's not fair, but ultimately, I do not see life as fair whatsoever. My parents are from Yugoslavia, as I said. The economy has been shattered down there. In comparison, Germany has a much, much better economy. This is why my parents went to Germany in the first place. And of course, the money was better. The life got better over there. I personally felt very 
very isolated because my family stayed in Macedonia. I was only surrounded by my mom, dad and sister. All the cousins, all the uncles, grandparents, they were all in Macedonia. Be that as it may, right now I'm living in Southeast Asia. And of course you see here that certain areas are underdeveloped, others on the other hand super developed as well. I personally see this as the game of life. Of course, some people will have an unfair advantage because they were there first, but so be it. As I said, I understand his point, but at the same time, it reminds me of victimhood mentality, where we always have to go back and see who did what first, who enslaved who, and now we are here, boo who, this is why I cannot prosper. I personally do not believe in that. I think that is an ideology of despair. I really believe that no matter where you are from, you can make it, especially in this day day and age. I've seen kids coming from India editing videos on Fiverr and making more money than anybody that works in Germany. It is possible after all. More R&D, more innovation, and the vicious cycle continues. This is a structural inequality that prevents other countries from catching up. The modern wonder of progress and constant economic growth is actually a modern nightmare that keeps the majority of the world's population in a perpetual state of inferiority. Isn't mankind supposed to live free? Maybe freedom is exactly the problem here. The whole purpose of endless technology and endless consumption is to give us more and more freedom. The life of inconvenience and perpetual toil of our ancestors is no more. Now we can live comfortably with all our needs, food, shelter, sex, entertainment, literally available to us at the touch of a button. And if a button is too taxing, just give voice commands. But even this is not good enough. Even this is not as convenient as possible. What if chips could be implanted in the brain so that we can Elon, the pizza Elon Musk. with our thoughts. Neuralink. But then we would have to chew the food, quite a chore. What if we could just automatically inject the nutrition of the pizza into our bodies and then virtually the simulate the, the sensations of enjoying a pizza? Right. But then why allow a clunky body to limit our freedom in the first place? Why not technologically enhance our bodies or better yet, ditch our bodies altogether by yep. uploading our consciousness into to the, the cloud so that we can exist mm -hmm. in a state of perpetual cybernetic bliss? Isn't this the logical end of freedom? Freedom realized to its fullest potential? But of course, this freedom would also mean no more human body. And no more human body means no more soft touch of another's warm embrace. No more watching the sunset. No more smelling the rain. No more reveling in the joyous laughter of your children. No more human life as we know it. The extinction of the human race. Is there another path? All right, and this is it for today's video. Long enough as it is, so I'm gonna cut it off here. Ultimately, it boils down to transhumanism. This is the promise of progressivism. This is the promise of liberalism that we can all upload ourselves into the cloud. As I said, in the end, the human touch, etc., etc., that will be missing not necessarily according to the tech overlords because you will experience all of that and even much more you won't be just a sterile metal machine you will experience all of those experiences in the cloud and much much more of course the question here is of course who experiences that i read an article that said going vegan is not vegan enough ultimately it is our dirty flesh bodies that excrete so much co2 and produce so much waste so the most vegan thing would be to upload ourselves into the cloud but ultimately they're offering you to get killed that's it they just want to get rid of your body they want to dispose of you and they want to upload you into the cloud 
consciousness has never been isolated. They do not understand what consciousness is. They have no conceptualization of a soul. They simply understand certain algorithms, certain synapses firing within your brain. And they want to copy that and bring it into the cloud. I'm sure it's going to work. All right, guys, but that's it for today's video. If you liked it, leave it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. And if you want to support this channel via Patreon, all the links are in the description box below. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, guys. As always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.